so much. Um, I said hi earlier. I'm Arun. I'm the AI lead at the conversations team at Square. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something that is just like a neat trick. It's a neat generation trick that we use in our chatbot to handle out of domain responses. Uh, so I don't need to say this. Over the last five years, we've had great progress on the penetration of uh, general purpose chatbots like these, as well as very specific task oriented chatbots like Erica from the Bank of America and our own uh, Square Assistant uh, for small businesses. Um, and one of the things that these chatbots have enabled is this natural language interface that can be incredibly convenient for people uh, to communicate about just about any type of question with a chatbot. And so if you have something like this, what's the weather today, boom, all of these chatbots will get it. Uh, the problem, though, is that because we've made our interface so broad, natural language, it can be anything. Users don't really know what that boundary is between what is in domain and what is out of domain. And so if I were to say something like this, I haven't been fired, just saying. Uh, if I were to say something like this, uh, the chatbots we have just don't know where it fits in our domain. Where does it fit? And I can just say that I don't think that that's like the most uh, empathetic response that I could get if I were to say this, just saying. Uh, what should we do as people who are thinking about developing these chatbots to handle these out of domain settings, and I can promise you we'll never be able to make everything in our domain. Uh, the kind of strategy or idea we have is to adopt this tried and tested uh, method that expert human communicators use, which is called reflective or empathetic listening. The idea is just by reflecting the user's language, we can emulate a sense of empathy and at least make them feel like they've been heard without honestly understanding what they said. So if we said, I got fired, I don't really know what that means, but at least I can understand this. something with sentiment. I can express sem a sympathy by saying, I'm sorry to hear you were fired, whatever that means. Um, and so this task that we propose called mimic and rephrase is fairly simple. Given an input prompt from the user, something like I just got fired, uh, and a particular speech act that we want to convey, uh, in this case, expressing sympathy, can we combine the two to convey that speech act while using as much language from the prompt as possible to emulate the sense of, uh, of, of hearing the other person. Uh, so for the rest of this uh, talk, high level takeaway is we can teach bots to perform this reflective listening using this generation task that we propose called mimic rephrasals. In the rest of this talk, I'll just cover what it means to be a good mimic rephrasal, and then talk about a data set we collected, some models, uh, and evaluation, and conclude. Uh, so we found five rough categories for what makes a good mimic rephrasal. It should be appropriate, convey the topic of interest. Uh, it should uh, be fluent, of course, be grammatical. Uh, it should be specific to, it should have the right level of specificity from the input prompt. Uh, it should of course, be concise and to the point. And most importantly, it should have a sense of repetitiveness. It should uh, mimic the user's language to emulate this sense of empathetic or reflective listening. Uh, let me ground this with an example. Uh, let's say for this particular input prompt, I have, uh, uh, hmm, I'm curious whether the swimming pool is open. Very generic response that's very similar to what most chatbots use today. Uh, it could apply for any response. It never gives that sense of being specific or actually addressing what I've asked. Uh, I'll show you what this leads to in a, in a deployment uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, there's some naive ways of, ref of just taking the input and shoving it into this sort of, I don't know why, in quotes, you said this, uh, that often can be either ungrammatical or just not capture the right point of the user's question. So it's non-trivial, but it seems like a simple task to go from what the, the customer or the user said to something that addresses their point. In this case, I don't know whether the swimming pool is open after 7 p.m. Um, and this is what we want. With that out of the way, uh, let's look at a, uh, a data set that we've collected for this task. Uh, we've looked at roughly two types of, um, of uh, speech acts. One is expressing sympathy, and the other is the informal lack of ability of the bot. Uh, <clears throat> in both of these tasks, we, we use Mechanical Turk in two stages. We first ask people to generate these stories or generate questions that we've collected, uh, and then ask them to 
create responses that express that speech act uh, while using empathetic listening. Uh, in total, we have about 10,000 uh, pairs for the I don't know data set, 6,000 for the emotive, uh, and they're about the same length uh, as the prompt. Uh, there's a lot of overlap, which again reinforces this is the task we're doing is trying to copy a lot of language from the user. More qualitatively, we see about 30 to 40 percent of these rephrasals involve some change of perspective from the, the customer's perspective to the bots. Uh, and another 15 to 40 involves some amount of subselection to like hone in on the key details that we should be responding to. And finally, there's a small set that are syntactically challenging that involves some non-trivial reordering of clauses. Uh, with that data set, let's look at some very simple models to try and do this rephrasing. Uh, we have just two. One was a, uh, a rule-based syntactic rewriting system. For those of you who have used Core NLP and are familiar with Semgrex, it's that. Uh, and we have a couple of patterns for how to reorder things to be grammatical. Uh, of course, we also uh, trained a neural network because it's 2018, or when this paper is uh, worked on. Uh, and it's a fairly standard model. We start with a bias TM with the tension. Uh, we add a copy mechanism because the whole task is about copying things from the input. Uh, and we had to do some tricks with uh, the beam search that we used in order to actually generate the right type of response. Um, in order to evaluate this model, uh, we had one part which was an automatic evaluation, which is just to get a sense of a, a pulse on how the models were doing. And really the only takeaway is that both the rule-based system and our fancy neural network do uh, comparably well. Um, the real test or the real measure is how do we do if we compare with uh, uh, human responses and what is how do we do an A-B test. Uh, and here the real takeaway is that the fancy neural model does almost as well as humans, which would be a 50-50 preference rate over here uh, on the I don't know data set. Uh, all the models do a little bit worse on the emotive data set, and this is just the uh, types of questions that people ask are just much more complicated, and uh, we also have less data to train a fancy model on. Uh, this is the real fun part. So we, we, we saw that we had this I don't know model that did pretty well on uh, relative to human on our A-B test, and we wanted to see how well it would do in practice. Give you a sense of the qualitative difference, let me show you two transcripts. Uh, both of these transcripts were uh, from our time as a startup, as Eloquent Labs, when we were working with an insurance company. So this is why this, like, there's a domain shift in terms of what we were working on. So uh, it's an insurance company, a customer would come in and say something like, I locked my keys in the car, what should I do? And this is something that, at least at the time, we, we did not have an answer for, we couldn't support. Uh, and so we'd say something like, I'm sorry, I think I missed something in there. To which they would immediately say, lockout support. Not, uh, and then we'd say, I still don't know what you mean. And they'd keep on rephrasing this until they would get frustrated and leave. Uh, I don't think this is a uh, unique experience. I have done this to chatbots too, because I know that they're likely stupid and I should just keep trying again and again. Uh, I, I'm guessing I'm not the only one here. Uh, the, uh, after using, after deploying the system that rephrased the user input, uh, what we noticed was that there was this market change in user behavior, uh, where they used to just rephrase by saying something more specific. I don't know if we have lockout support. Uh, people would either take us up on help uh, to go talk to an, uh, a representative, or they would ask another question they had and move on. Uh, and that was like our big takeaway from this, uh, this experiment. All right, uh, that's more or less all I have. Uh, just to conclude, uh, what we saw was that we can handle these out of domain responses in a chatbot gracefully by teaching them this technique of reflective listening. It's a very simple generation task, uh, and that's a pro. That means that simple models are able to perform comparably well with humans, and we are actually able to deploy this in practice. Uh, the data set models are available. Uh, happy to take any questions if I have time for it. Do I have time for it? So, um, great work. Uh, I have a question about out of domain. Mm -hmm. So in some sense to know that getting fired is a negative thing, you still need that kind of data. 
So it's not fully out of domain because you need to collect the data set that will reflect those kind of questions. Um, have you done experiments in which is fully out of domain and what's accuracy for those things? So it is, you're absolutely right about like, figure, like how do you figure out what is out of domain? Uh, the deployment we had was really for this I don't know set. So the, there are some rules. We basically can identify it's a question uh, and we can identify that this question doesn't match anything in our knowledge base. Uh, it's possible that our model was bad and it does match something in our knowledge base, but uh, here too I think it's a better user experience to just tell them uh, I wasn't able to find it rather than have them continuously try and try again. Um, but it is an important point that there is, figuring out what is outside the data set is important and we do this in a simple heuristic way. Listening in sort of like the emotive space because like if, if you were if you were to say I'm happy that you were fired but if the model were to say that by accident like that'd be a pretty significant. You are absolutely <laughs> right, and and there are guardrails that we have uh, when we're we're using in the I don't know setting. Uh, for example, if there's any profanity in the input, we will not use it. Uh, these are like this is a good good point, and uh, at least we find like. With some guardrails, it works out well. There are, of course, embarrassing examples uh, where it could can go wrong, uh, and like I, I will not say that you can just take this out of the box and try and use it.